This is Off to Off Topic, a show where two men with the attention spans of a squirrel try and fail to stay on topic with the day's subject. Where will their oral meanderings take us? Well, stick around and listen, because today's Off to Off Topic topic is... Part 2 of our series on Elvira. In our first episode, we took you from Cassandra's tragic childhood up to her days as a teenage go-go dancer for the troops. This episode starts off with a concussion and ends with Cassandra meeting the legendary drag queen Divine, and a whole lot in between. 1969, and the Denver Pop Festival was being held at Mile High Stadium in Denver. This show is basically mini Woodstock in Denver, attracting 50,000 people and having such acts as Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappra, Creedence Clearwater Reviver, and Joe Cocker. Credence Clearwater Revival. There we go. I botched that. I wasn't going to say anything. (laughs) Yeah. Lord knows I'm not... Yeah, Lord knows I I miss say things all the time. Yeah, sometimes I just have many strokes, I think. (laughs) Cassandra and her roommates uh, were all about this uh, music festival. Got together and said, hey, let's go meet some bands. Oh, yeah. Side note, you know how uh, at sporting events, the crowds do the wave, you know, where they do that thing, they all stand up and sit back down. It looks like a big wave. Yes. Uh, Some people think that Frank Zappa actually invented it here at this uh, concert. Other people say it was Husky Stadium in Seattle in the 70s. I think I saw it. I don't know. I saw a tapestry once of like a bunch of people doing that in the you know Middle Ages. Really? Oh yeah. No, oh yeah. The old I, videos from the Middle lying. Ages. <laughs> you know, it's an old zoetrope from the uh, Middle Ages. If you just spin it real fast, it's like. <laughs> it's like really? No, <laughs> so bullshit. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, I just surely that he's not the only one that like no one's ever thought to do that before. It sounds like a scene out of Black Knight or one of those movies, the one where like Martin Lawrence goes back in time. <laughs> yeah, right. Good Lord, Black Knight, what a pull. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Cassandra and her roommates did their usual routine of wandering around hotels trying to meet celebrities what they could. Doing this, Cassandra's friend actually got to sleep with a member of Iron Butterfly and got syphilis out of the deal. So there's that. Oh, way to go. <laughs> yeah, way to go. Uh she also met Frank Zappra, who she said was the only person that she met that wasn't high that night. In fact, he actually did a fatherly lecture about how she is far too young to be doing this kind of thing. Go you know, Frank Zappa. Like more, not that I ever think about him, but you know, I guess going forward when he comes up, like he's a good dude. Actually, I have heard nothing but really good things about him. And like, apparently he wasn't like staunch anti-drug, but he like didn't do any drugs or nothing. He was just naturally weird. Now, did he not do any drugs? Was he California straight or was he like regular straight? I think he was actually regular straight, but I'm not positive on that. Yeah. Yeah. Surprising, huh? Later down the road, Cassandra would actually become friends with the Zappa family, including Frank and his kids, Dweezil, Moon Unit, and others. Moon Unit. (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? It sounds like a porn star from space or something like that. Hello, I am Moon Unit. Bring me your sexiest women from Earth. (laughs) Uh... The second day of the event was the big one, with Jimi Hendrix headlining. For this uh, day of the concert, there was a huge mob of people forming outside the stadium. And these people decided, we want to see the show, but we don't want to spend money. So at one point, the large crowd said, screw it, stormed the venue, knocking down the fences and trampling people left and right. Who would get caught up in the middle of this? Yep, Cassandra. Well, the police kind of had an idea that there was going to be something like this happening, so they actually had the riot uh, police there. As soon as the mob charged, chaos ensued. The local police started firing off tear gas canisters. Cassandra started running around trying to figure out where to go, what to do, and all of a sudden, thwomp, lights out for Cassandra. She wakes up in a medical tent, dazed with a huge lump on her head. Turns out she was cold cocked by a tear gas grenade, hit her right upside the head. Yeah. Oh, look, there's a crowd. Let's try to get them organized. Let's shoot yeah. tear gas <laughs> Right? Them. I feel like there's probably better ways to do that, but yeah. I mean, when you, yeah, got, sure. when you got a bunch of... When you got some tear gas uh, you got to get rid of before it expires, got to launch it at somebody. I mean, I get it. You need to get the crowd of control, but man, just, I don't know. Poor choices. What yeah, I yeah, I mean, just, they're, yeah. They're cops. What do you expect? I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, exactly. they should be lucky it wasn't live rounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is true. Cassandra gets released by the doctors after she gets checked out. Now she's wandering around the back of the venue because, you know, like where the medical tent was. She suddenly runs into a large black Afro man who looks at her and says, yo, want to meet Jimi Hendrix? Was this real or just a concussion doing its thing, she thought? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's where he pulled out his little penis that he named Jimmy and has a little afro on it. (laughs) I call him Jimmy Hendrix. Oh, yeah, Jimmy is another term for a penis, huh? All right. It is. It is indeed. Either way, concussion or not, Cassandra's like, well, I can't pass up the possible opportunity to meet Jimmy. 
So she said yes, and the guard led her to Jimmy's trailer, and there he was, on his bed in the back, plucking away on guitar springs. Springs? Strings. Awesome springs, too. Who knows? Both. <laughs> he was wasted. He, yeah, he right. Was not, he was not Zampa. <laughs> he was California fucked up. Uh, those little uh, springs that uh, keep your door from hitting the wall. He's like laying on the ground, spring, one of those bang, bang. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yo, what's going on out there? Jimmy asked about the commotion. Cassandra explained the riot and the tear gassing, and this sent Jimmy down a rant about how he hated the man and how he was done with America and he was moving to England to get away from the man because if we know, England has never been the man in all their history of time. No, no <laughs> yeah. England's never done anything that might yeah. be considered. Right. You know, England, oppressive. where there's never been any racism or anything like that. They've never been the man. <laughs> Just that small, unassuming island. That just so happened to take over half the world at some point. One thing that you mentioned that you remember about Jimi Hendrix is the fact that he sounded very, very angry during this rant, but he still still spoke very calmly, which was totally different than most musicians she met who went on rants who were just like screaming their heads off. Nope. Jimi was very firm yet calm, which I don't know. That kind of sounds cool. Sounds like I'd take more notice of somebody doing that than somebody just like screaming and pounding a table. Yeah, I mean, because they sound more intentional. You know, you get yeah, somebody yeah. screaming and yelling and pounding. It's like, Okay, someone's off their meds, but yeah. yeah, yeah, you're just raging right now and saying whatever. But you know, if somebody's like very good at uh, putting together what they're saying, you're like, hmm, he's thought about this. So they talked for a few moments until one of Jimmy Handler's came to get him for a set. On his way out, Jimmy actually handed Cassandra his phone number, told him to give her a call, and gave her one hell of a passionate kiss on the way out. Cassandra was on cloud nine. Not only did she get to meet one of her heroes, but she also got his number. Huzzah! Sadly, this would be the last show that the Jimi Hendrix experience would ever perform together as Jimi would go off to England and die shortly after this. <laughs> I was always with the joke, like, and then he died. And yep. Sure enough, and then he died. <laughs> yep. Yeah, he basically went from here to Woodstock, then went over to uh, Europe, and pff, that was the end of that. But before he died, and uh, before he actually went over to Woodstock, Cassandra called the number that she was given. After ringing forever, somebody actually did answer. It was a lady. Yeah, kind of a bummer, but she heard a party going on in the background. She was like, Hey, is Jimmy there? And lady on the phone's like, who the hell's this? He's like, is Jimmy there? She explained what it was, blah, blah, blah. This Cassandra from backstage is like, eh, all right. A few moments later of waiting, waiting, waiting. All of a sudden the line picks up. Hey, it's Jimmy on the line who uh, apparently he was way too high or wasted on something because all he could do is just mumble incoherently. She couldn't even make out what he was saying. It's just like, hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Um, uh. And then after a moment of really awkward conversation, the line just kind of went dead. She didn't know if he just dropped the phone or if he passed out or what the hell happened. Cassandra was pretty bummed about this and went back to her life as go-go dancing high schooler. Uh, speaking of actually high school, she was about to graduate and really hadn't thought about what to do with her life until one of her teachers just came up and asked her, what do you want to do with your life, young Cassandra? After a moment of thinking, she uh, kind of reluctantly responded, I always wanted to be a Las Vegas showgirl. And uh, she kind of assumed he would just start laughing like, that's stupid. Why are you being so stupid, you stupid girl? Slap. Yeah, yeah, basically, that's kind of what she was expecting. But nope, he looked her dead in the eye and said, then do it. Just go do your dream. Whatever you want to, don't hold yourself back. Go be a Vegas showgirl. And uh, she was just like, oh, my God, I could become a Vegas showgirl if I wanted to. Holy crap. That was a good teacher. I mean, yeah. Yeah. honestly, it really was. Because I mean, I remember uh, reading when one teacher was talking about his uh, his experience of teaching, and he said there's one student in his class who never paid attention. He was failing. He was bombing. And he, like he and all he did all day was draw. And he walked over and looked at his sketchbook. And he's like, "These are really good. What do you want to do?" And the um, kid's like, "I want to be a tattoo artist." And the kid was 18. He goes, "Leave. Get out of here. Drop out. Go to be. You don't need. You don't need this high school. You don't need education to be a tattoo artist. And you're really good. So go. And the kid did. And the like. He said um, about ten years later, he ran into him, and he was like a well known tattoo artist. Like he he definitely did need it. So I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that teachers need to be uh, convincing kids to quit school, but someone who's willing to like encourage the kid to follow their dreams. Yeah, you know, that's the kind of teacher. This sounds like a Steve's sweet story, but that student was probably a total a hole, and the teacher just wanted him out of his class. Yeah, like, God, yeah. how can He's, I get rid of this kid? There's like six months till graduation. I'm not effing dealing with this little. That's shit. the undercurrent. This guy was a yeah. constant problem. <laughs> like I said earlier, Cassandra didn't live with her family anymore, but she did come by and hang out and visit with her parents and sisters on occasion. And on spring break, 1968. Her parents and sisters loaded up in the family truckster and headed off for vacation in California via a pit stop in Vegas. 
which was kind of their routine when they'd go on a little vacation, family vacation. This time, having to fire becoming a showgirl lid under her, Cassandra begged her parents to take her to a real-life showgirl show, just like in Viva Las Vegas. Her parents said, eh, all right, sure, why not? If this is your dream, we'll take you there and you can see what it's all about. So they went to the Arabian Nights-themed hotel, The Dunes, to see Casino de Paris, one of the hottest shows on the Strip at the time. Uh, long story short, they went, they got their seats, like, way in the back of the club. The parents, like, ordered her a drink. They're like, here, you can have this little champagne drink. Just don't let anybody see you drinking kind of thing. And then, all of a sudden, out of the clear boo, one of the stage managers, a French lady named Puff, <laughs> saw Cassandra and thought to herself, now there looks like someone who'd want to be a Las Vegas showgirl. And uh, basically took Cassandra to the back room and gave her an audition right then and there. They liked what they saw and offered her a job on the new show starting in the fall that they were putting together. One problem was, Cassandra was only 17 at the time, too young to work as a showgirl, unless her parents signed a waiver for her. Her parents were uh, actually pretty convinced that this was a human trafficking setup because there's a whole moment where like her, her parents and everybody got pulled in this back room with a meeting with like some old French dude who was like, oh, you want your daughter to be a showgirl? Have her sign this contract and she can do everything. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but parents were like, this has to be a human trafficking kind of thing. They're bound to be kidnapping her. But the manager said, hey, no, here's the contract. Take it. Go take a lawyer. You've got a couple of months to decide. The show filming doesn't start until like or uh, practices doesn't start until August or July. And that's what the parents did. They took the paperwork later on down the road, took it to a lawyer and lawyer's like, eh, seems legit. So the parents were like, eh, all right, cool. We can get rid of our wild child daughter, I guess, and have, give her the job she always wanted if we sign this. I, I don't know. I think it'd be like, okay, whoa, whoa, time out, time out, time out. Seems legit or huh. legit? Because I don't want you, I'm not going to shit my daughter off for a seems legit. I need definitive answers. Well... <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure he did say it was legit, but also at the point, uh, same time, she did say the parents had to save up money and buy a cheap lawyer, so they might have gotten Lionel Hutz. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Lionel, did you even <laughs> read that contract? No, but it seemed like a contract when I looked at it. <laughs> it's a it's a contract. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that contract is yeah. totally for human trafficking, but you said it seemed fine. Oh, yeah, it's perfectly good human con- uh, human trafficking contract. Oh, was that not? <laughs> the, did you not yeah. want that? Oh, I thought you wanted the money for sitting your... Oh, all right, well, should have hired a better lawyer. <laughs> Uh. Cassandra had landed her dream job at last and was over the moon ecstatic. She packed up her things and moved to the Vegas Strip and moved into an apartment with some of her fellow showgirls. Uh, this excitement dulled a little bit when she realized that uh, being a showgirl is insanely hard with long hours, lots of practicing, and lots of really cranky people. Uh, yeah, I'm sure dealing with your share fair sexual harassment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they also got a bunch of weird rules, like you cannot gain more than five pounds from the starting weight when they hire you. Uh, whenever you're on stage, you have to constantly be smiling nonstop, this very specific smile. You cannot stop smiling for even a second or you can get fired. You can't ride horses or do any dangerous activities that could injure you. And also no tan lines ever. You ever seen with the tan line? You're out of a job. Wow. She also, yeah, yeah, right. And like, if you're wondering about it's like, can't ride horses or do anything dangerous, it's because, you know, they have their set crew and if somebody gets injured then the whole show is basically thrown off and they don't really have like backups or standbys per se so you know if dancer number four breaks their leg and they're the most important dancer of the thing well then the show's kind of effed that's true yeah she also had one of those stereotypical super uptight and yells a lot at the show director and that wasn't much fun so uh you know whenever you see like the i don't know simpsons kind of did in a few other shows where it's just like the dance instructor who's just a major pain in the butt just screaming stomping and yelling at people she had one of those. In fact, she told one story where uh, she wasn't able to quite get her uh, steps quite right. And the dance instructor came over and started screaming, move this foot. And immediately just started stomping the crap out of one of her feet just to get his point across and like bruise the crap out of her foot. Seems kind of, you know, the opposite of the whole don't injure yourself thing. But whatever. I was just thinking that I'm like, OK, you, you have all these like, <laughs> yeah, I know. she was like she had to walk around with a limp like three days after they did that. So <laughs> Yeah, for the love of God, don't injure these girls. The guy's like, slam. (laughs) Right. Uh, I had the exact same thought when I was reading that book. I'm like, wait a minute. But you just said. (laughs) And to top it off, Cassandra wore glasses and unable to wear them for the show. It made practice a nightmare because her vision was not that great. Oh, yeah. And working there, she did manage to meet a bunch of famous people as well. Because once you... uh, when she first got hired there, I should say, one of the rules was she, because she was under 18, she couldn't go into the casino floor. She couldn't go into the bar area. She basically had to enter the entire casino through like this weird back door that bypassed everything because 
you know, she was underage. Also, at 17, she was the youngest showgirl ever in Vegas at this point. I mean, they must, she must have been, they really liked her. Cause I mean, I mean, even as a hiring manager of GameStop, I hesitated to hire people under 18 or sorry. Yeah, under 18, because there's all those rules. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure back in the day, those rules weren't there. Let's be real. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to say like, oh, yeah. Yeah, because this is 1967-ish. Right. But still, I mean, I don't know. Like, hire, I'm just thinking about just the fact that you need some special, oh, she has to go through the back. She can't go here. She can't do that uh, because she's under, underage. Then why hire her? You know, hire someone who can. Well, also, too, casinos back then were run by the mobs. Probably still are, so. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, if this doesn't work out, we can just bury her in a backfield somewhere. <laughs> Once Cassandra turned 18, the real fun started, and she could start hanging out on the casino floors and bars in her off time and meet some celebrities. Aw, oh, yeah. Well, working there, she did manage to meet Sammy Davis uh, Jr. And actually, there's kind of a funny story. I should have written it down, but uh, Sammy Davis was showed up to watch the uh, complete show that they had, uh, they were doing, that she was in. And they knew Sammy Davis was going to be there, so she thought it'd be funny that she bought a glass eye in a... Uh, pawn shop and she like attached it as part of her uh outfit as kind of like a little secret uh easter egg kind of thing yeah and sammy davis saw it and he thought it was the funniest thing in the world yeah she was kind of nervous too she's like he's either gonna find this hilarious or he's gonna be pissed at me he found it hilarious yay yay she also got to make out with a drunk siegfried of siegfried and roy who uh drunkenly offered to take her virginity but um Apparently it didn't happen. There's actually a lot of stories about her like making out with celebrities, but uh, it sounds like, you know, either they would get interrupted or equipment malfunction or one would pass out or something. And, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. I, I, wait, Siegfried and Roy. Yes. Siegfried of Siegfried and Roy made out with her and wanted to take her virginity. Yes. I, Is, I, I mean, did he think she was like, <laughs> what? wait, this Siegfried from Siegfried and Roy. That, that, I think of everything you said in the story. I find that like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, that blew me away. Like, time out. What the fuck are you talking about? Siegfried from Siegfried and Roy. Well, the thing is, maybe Siegfried's one of those guys where he's just like, hey, I'm not straight or gay. I have way too much love to give to, you know, be stuck to one sexuality. I mean, maybe. Maybe she thought she was a drag queen. The reason why he get any further, once she found out she wasn't packing, he's like, oh, wait. Ha! <laughs> He just starts fiddling around with his hands like, wait a yeah. minute, something's missing. He reaches down below. He's like, whoa. He's like, oh, a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I thought you knew. He's like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my hair blew back when you said Siegfried. Like, she's like, I was like, time out. <laughs> Everyone shut up. <laughs> all the little dudes in lab coats inside your brain were just like one of them hit like the stop button the big red stop button like wait a minute wait a minute we need to process this real quick <laughs> several of them like just just like shoot themselves in the head can't take it <laughs> <laughs> never would have guessed you'd hear about it because uh elvira making out with siegfried of siegfried and roy okay i i'm, I'm back on track now but still that like you said that and you're like he made it with siegfried and roy just everything in my head burn, burn, <laughs> screech to a halt like whoa we need to we need to actually make sure we heard what we your heard. brain had the same reaction as if your wife like pulled off a mask to reveal a lizard person underneath be like right. whoa hold up hold up <laughs> did not see this coming like, you're like whoa whoa uh, this is shocking but you know what's more shocking did you know Elvira made up from <laughs> Siegfried from Siegfried Roy <laughs> <laughs> <Ha. Whew>. okay yeah <clears throat> <laughs> uh. She also got to go on a date with Alan Osmond, the oldest of the Osmond kids, and also met a super young Donnie and Marie. Apparently, Donnie was very eager to sit on her lap for the dinner date. <laughs> Wait, he sat in her lap? Yeah, he da- Donnie did. Yeah, oh, Donnie, Donnie yeah. Because he was a little kid this time. He was like nine and she was uh, 17. Okay. Yeah, okay. Makes she sense. was on a date with the oldest of the Osmonds. I, I'm with you. I, I picture, of course, adult, like adult Donnie. I mean, yeah, no, little kid Donnie. But she did meet uh, Donnie as an adult and uh, brought that up to him. He's like, wasn't that cute? And he's like, you want to recreate that scene? Eh, wink, wink. <laughs> right. Yeah. One time, one of Cassandra's friends took her and uh, herself on a double date with a couple of bodybuilders. Cassandra's date was a bodybuilder named Franco Colombo, And her friend's date was Franco's friend, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Only one date uh, they had between all of them. And they went to a all-you-can-eat buffet. And Cassandra remembers the fact that those two dudes could eat a shocking amount of protein. She's like, they would just walk up with a plate in each hand, just like load up with as much meat as they could, like literally like three meals worth for each plate. Go back, just eat it all and then head back for refills. That's the main thing she remembers on the date. They're really sweet guys and they could eat so much food. Makes sense though. I mean, they're bodybuilders. Yeah. 
I mean, that's kind yeah. of the thing. Yeah, when you're burning, you know, 10,000 calories a day, you got to eat a lot to take, take it back in. She also got to meet Frank Sinatra at one point. She also got to meet Little Richard, who uh, backstage saw her smoking a cigarette, and Little Richard stormed over, ripped the cigarette out of her hand, and told her, Girl, if God had wanted you to smoke, he'd put a chimney on your head. That sounds like somebody who probably knows somebody who's died of smoking kind of thing, because I've known a couple other people that are along the lines of, like, they'd yank a cigarette out of a kid's mouth and yet lecture them, and they were usually the kind of people who was like, yeah, my grandma died in front of me kind of deal. So, hmm. she did not follow that advice, by the way. She kept smoking. No, of course not. I mean, fair enough, like, but at the same time, like, dude, fuck off, man. <laughs> she once went to a party with Paul Anka, Engelbert Humperdinck, and Andy Williams, who later on, Andy Williams would sexually assault her backstage. Oh, boo. Y- yeah. He uh, basically, uh, they're in the party with those guys I mentioned earlier. Then all of a sudden, like everybody in the room just kind of left and it was just her and Andy Williams together. And he like grabbed her and started trying to kiss her. And she wound up biting his lip and running away. No, good for her. Yeah, good for her. Fuck him. One of her roommates uh, in Vegas started dating Wilt Chamberlain, who she became somewhat friends with and referred to him as Uncle Wilty. But the biggest and most influential meeting uh, in Vegas would happen when her childhood idol Elvis Presley showed up to watch her show. Not for her. He was just like in Vegas and they're like, hey, he's coming to see our show. Eee! Elvis was doing his comeback at the ripe old age of 34 and everybody was losing their minds on Elvis coming back to Vegas. And everybody's even lo- more losing their minds that he was going to go see this one particular show. Because uh, Cassandra wasn't the only Elvis fan in that group. Everybody was an Elvis fan. Everybody loved Elvis. So Elvis showed up, watched the show. Actually really liked it and invited the showgirls back, uh, back to you know his little hotel party room or whatever just to hang out and shoot the shit and meet everybody. And this was, you know, everybody's dream moment. They're like, oh my God, we get to go meet Elvis. And they did. And uh, Cassandra hung out there and kept hanging out, kept hanging out. Eventually, it was literally just her and Elvis hanging out in a quote unquote conversation pit talking. A dream come true. They talked for actually a long time, apparently. And she said it was mainly him talking because she was like too uh, starstruck and just kind of like, uh, and too afraid to say something dumb. I get that. And, uh, Elvis, though, talked about a lot of deep stuff, religion, self-help, numerology, and he also completely lectured her on the evils of drugs and why nobody should ever, ever take drugs. Oh, yeah, I, I expected that part. I mean, yeah, Elvis I, was very anti-drug, unless it came from a doctor. Which is well, anti-drug and also, like, religious. I remember seeing, yeah. like, like, he got all these people in the room, they're like, yay, and he just, like, preached them for, like, three hours. Yep. It's like, hey, ah. man, rock and roll is kind of a sin, all right? No. Now, let me tell you about the time I slept with my mom. <laughs> ha! Uh, ew. Yeah. At the end of the night, Elvis would give her what she feels is some of the best advice of her life. After talking to her, and they actually wound up at a piano and kind of did like a song. Uh, he played the piano and they sort of sang together a little bit. And even though she wasn't a professional singer at this point, Elvis thought, saw potential in her and said, Hey, girl, you are far too young, smart, and talented to waste your life as a showgirl. Vegas is going to chew you up and spit you out like I've seen it do to a million other people. You true. need to go take some singing lessons, get the hell out of here, and make something else of yourself. Cassandra took that advice to heart, and she actually says if anybody other than Elvis had told her that advice, she would have told him to go F off, because what do you know? You can't tell me my dreams. But she's like, hey, if somebody knows uh, the Vegas showbiz, that would be Elvis. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Elvis's words were kind of like, he's known a lot of showgirls, and after they uh, become showgirls, they either became uh, waitresses or hookers. Yeah, I mean, there's not much continuing, uh, you know. Yeah, and I mean, the shelf show life girls. of a, yeah, and the shelf life that has to be really short, like mid 30s, maybe. I mean, honestly, it depends on how uh, your genetics are, you know, how long yeah, how long you're Yeah, this is true. Cause, yeah, some people look, you know, 70 by the age of 30, so. Hmm. Oh God. And I've been working at, Ga- or working at uh, Macy's for a little bit. I've met 90 year olds who look uh, 40. I mean, yeah, right. I know there's some people like, that are like, you, you talk to them and you think they're closer to your age. And they're like, Oh no, I'm 20 years older. And you're like, huh? Mm, all right. Like clean living. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> nope. I've done so many drugs that they just right. killed all the bad things in my body. Even cancer can't survive in here. I thought I told Mr. Burns. He's like, oh, yeah, Mr. Disease. Burns. I was thinking the Rolling Stones guy whose name I can't think. Keith Richards. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Anyways, hearing Elvis say, get out of Vegas, she decided that's what I'm going to do. Big romantic kiss to end the night, and they never saw each other again after that. The second biggest celebrity meeting she had in Vegas was with new superstar Tom Jones, the hot guy on the scene. 
She went to see the show and she was immediately awestruck by him. She said not only was he one of the sexiest, uh, most animalistic men she's ever seen on stage, but he could put on a show like no other. Apparently this dude back in the day could dance. He could gyrate and swing his hips and move around the stage. She said, unlike any dude she's ever seen at that point, you know, the whole shirt unbuttoned down to the navel with a hairy chest sticking out. She's like, my God, so hot. <laughs> yeah. Cassandra would actually wind up backstage meeting Tom and they actually kind of hit it off. This is a, uh, that's not unusual. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm standing so by that. I did a little dance when I said that. Nope, you you stand by that. Be proud of that one. Then they went back to his hotel room where uh, Tom Jones and Cassandra were like, "Hey, we're gonna make out and get it on." And uh, almost immediately, Tom Jones basically just hopped on Cassandra and started going at it uh, with her. And that's who she lost her virginity to was Tom Jones. Oh wow, she lost all the way to Tom Jones. That's not bad. Yep, at at eighteen. So, uh, real quick, too, there is a rumor back in the day that uh, Tom Jones had this giant bulge in his pants, and it was because he stuffed socks in there because there's no way a man had a bulge that big. Yeah. Well, this story confirms that, no, he does not stuff his pants because he has an enormous hog, and between the enormous hog, her being a virgin, and his kind of rough loving, she required stitches after the fact. Oh, wow. Yeah, he did some damage to her hoo-ha. Yeah, in fact, it started hurting so, uh, the sex started hurting so bad, she immediately started screaming, oh God, oh God, please stop, I'm a virgin, you're hurting me. And which resulted, Tom Jones, to his credit, he did stop, and then lecture would be like, you expect me to believe the showgirl's a virgin, you dumb bitch, kind of thing. And then after her crying a lot and stuff, he basically kicked her out of her room, and that was the end of that at the moment. Oh wow, that's super romantic. Isn't it though? In her biography, though, she also goes on to talk about how incredibly naive she was at the time, because even though this is the way it went down and it was Tom Jones, she was still getting sewed up at the doctor's office saying to herself, hey, we had sex. I'm obviously Mrs. Tom Jones now. We're a couple and we're going to get married eventually. It finally clicked when she tracked him down at a hotel at uh, his hotel and caught him making out with a couple of his back uh, backup dancers. Her first thought was, oh, my God, I caught my man cheating on me. And then about mm, half a second later, it dawned on her. Oh, yeah, I was just as fuck. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, credit, credit I mean, to her, though, for admitting she was naive at the time and, you know, putting that out there. Yeah. I mean, she, I mean, she, good on her. She didn't like become, quote, quote, like crazy where. Yeah. Stalk him, murder him or something. No, her heart was kind of broken, though. She's like, oh. Mm. I mean, and fair enough. I mean, it just, yeah. She, like I said, naive. It just, I mean, it's still just, it uh, sucks that, you know, that's how she had to learn. Like, sorry. Especially after he destroyed her. Several years later, Cassandra would run into Tom Jones at a party and would wander up to him just to see how he's doing. Be like, hey, Tom, you remember me? And uh, he looked at her and responded, oh, yeah, you're the one with all the scars on your back. And then went back to talking to his buddies. Dick thing to say, Tom. Dick thing to say. Yeah, that, fuck that guy. Yeah, yeah. And she was like, oh, well, gee, now I wish I had never met you, Tom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that's... <laughs> I had no real feelings toward Tom Jones other than just like, I don't know, whatever. But now I, I have very bad feelings toward Tom Jones. Yeah, right around this time, her Vegas show was winding down and she decided that it was time to take Elvis' advice and get out of Dodge. It was the early 70s and off to Italy she goes, where she stays with some of the producers from the show she performed in. They actually had a house over in England or Europe and they're like, hey, we're going to go back there and stay for a while where we figure out stuff you want to come with. And she was like, all right, cool. Sounds good to me. So uh, she goes off to Italy, stays there. There she got to meet legendary Italian filmmaker Federico Fellini and Basically, gets to be a background character in his film, Roma, which I guess was a famous movie back then. She wasn't much more than a blip of red hair in the scene, and uh, but she was on the movie set for a few weeks, learning the movie uh, roles, or moving, learning the movie lifestyle, being on sets, you know, following orders, doing cues, this and that. You know, this entire time, this entire time, I'm a picture in my head with black hair, and it's like, the moment you said red hair, I'm like, that's right, she yep. has red hair. Yeah, that's why she's called Big Red, too, with her big tatas and red hair. Yep, there you go. She would also get a few uh, small roles in spaghetti westerns and the such. She would also, while over there in uh, Italy, join a pop-funk bossa nova band named E Latins Otata. And uh, they toured a bit with him, but the band eventually fell apart when uh, she learned that her and the other female singer were getting paid exactly half what the male members were. And, yeah, that's kind of messed up, too. And they were like, well, screw that, we're out. Yeah, as they should. This band did tour, tour with uh, Herbie Hancock at one point, and Cassandra made out with him in a closet before he got interrupted for a set. Hey, let's see. It was pretty rough in Europe for the most part. Fun, but she was broke all the time. One day when she was uh, struggling to find rent, 
she who should she run to at a cafe? Why, Uncle Wilty. Wilt Chamberlain just happened to be over in uh, Italy at the time. And they had lunch, caught up, talked for a while. And at the end of the uh, meal, he slipped her a hundred bucks just to help her out, which that was about a month's rent for her over there. So that was kind of freaking nice. Yeah. Like, hell yeah. With Wilt Chamberlain, I thought he'd yeah. slip, slip or something else. Mm, foreshadowing. It became obvious Europe wasn't going to work out, so in 1973, at the age of 22, Cassandra decided to head back to the U.S. of A. and live with her parents until she figured out what to do next. Thankfully, that didn't take long, as a couple of weeks later, one of the guys from her Vegas show days called up, called her up and said, Hey, you want to be on my new show? It's at the Playboy Club in Miami. Oh, hell yeah, I'm on my way, she said. This then, the Playboy Club was where she was also master the art of tassel spinning, finally. I, w- I would assume the play. I would assume the Playboy t- Club would be a strip club. I mean, am I um, wrong? Actually, uh, it's more of just a nightclub, actually. Uh, actually, nudity wasn't really a thing. There was some topless stuff, but for the most part, she was actually just working as a hostess for the parties there and doing a little bit of modeling. Yeah, the uh, I mean, Playboy Club is actually kind of... She's also going to be for, with a Playboy modeling agency later, which also is kind of not really related to the whole nude magazine thing. Same company, just this isn't really a new thing. There's more of a, hey... You can just come out and hang out with Playboy bunnies who are dressed. Well, I work for a very brief, I work for a week, you know, just a week at a strip club. Um, and I worked as a, this is so stupid. I mean, um, I never even got paid for it because I was under the table and I just left. So they, you know, I, I mean, they forgot I even existed. So I can't go be like, you owe me a week's pay. I, you know, that was fucking years ago, <laughs> uh, 20, pl- 20 plus years now. Uh, but I worked as a kitchen in the kitchen. And we worked like lunches and stuff. And I never do dinners, but the strip club was split the two because the side that served food um, was boobs only. And the other side, which I didn't really get, I wasn't over there, um, was full nudity. So they couldn't have food and stuff around full nudity. They could only have like topless. Yeah, that sounds like so, a hygiene problem. Cause yeah, <laughs> I assume it was probably something similar. I found a pubic hair in my food, cook. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, you're in the nude area. What do you expect? <laughs> Well, let's be real. The people are hanging. The people eating in the nude area don't mind the hair oh, no. being in their food. That would be a bonus, actually, in their world. Probably yeah. the health inspector, on the other hand, he cares. <laughs> he might have some. He or she might have something to say. About or she, that. yeah. Uh, but yeah, the uh, Playboy Club here in Miami. You know, as far as I could tell, it wasn't really a whole new thing. It was basically just like, hey, come here and party at the Playboy Club. We've got drugs and alcohol, and. uh <laughs> Apparently, the health, health inspectors have nothing to say about that. <laughs> yeah, Not like nudity, no <laughs> coke, sure, whatever. Yep. Hey, it was Miami in the seventies, and she was like, everybody was doing cocaine. You couldn't walk by one person without them pulling out cocaine and be like, eh, eh, eh. Yeah, fair but, enough. Uh, yeah, she uh, still not too much into the cocaine at this point because, yeah, you know, she's still a hyper youngin. At this point, that doesn't sound good. Yeah, yeah, foreshadowing again. Term I've used <laughs> a lot in this episode. <laughs> uh, during this job, she met Matt, who was a singer in a band. They started dating, and when her uh, show at the Playboy Club ended, the two decided to move to Los Angeles together, with, where uh, he would become a musician, and she would work on becoming an actor. Uh, the becoming an actor part was kind of a pain in the butt because of the SAG card paradox, as they call it. You gotta have a SAG card to get an acting gig, but in order to get a SAG card, you have to act. <laughs> I know, it uh, sounds kind of weird, but yeah, it's one of those things that's like, hey, you want a SAG card? You got any acting experience? No. How do I get acting experience? Well, first you have to have a SAG card and get a job. Apparently that like loophole just kills a lot of acting careers because you kind of need an in. Yeah, that's messed up. <clears throat> yeah, I've actually heard this before too. And yeah, it is messed up. Another thing that Cassandra needed to find was an agent, which was also extremely difficult because no one was really interested in a mid twenties ex Las Vegas showgirl with barely any acting experience and no SAG card. The only really uh, agents she found that had interest in her were those creepy kind of agents who show up at your house and they're like, let's go over this script together, please. And then yeah. at the end of the script, it's like they get naked and they embrace passionately. Apparently, that is like a legitimate thing that sleazy agents or supposed agents will do to try to get with actresses. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I've also heard that like actors and actresses will try to do that too. If they're like, you know, want to get with somebody, they'll just show up at the house and be like, you want to go over these script lines with me? And yeah, kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, that sounds, yeah, that sounds right. For the... Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a Hollywood thing. It sounds like an anywhere thing, to be honest, actually. Yeah. Yeah, you told yeah. that story. I didn't question me. I, I didn't. You know, there's that yeah, whole. Yeah, like, that, uh, that, that tracks. There's that casting couch thing for a reason. As luck would have it, though, on a trip back to Colorado to visit her folks, Cassandra got a call from one of her Vegas show friends. He was doing a musical for Goldie Hawn and needed someone to show Goldie Hawn around town and see the sights with her. 
Cassandra and Goldie had a great time when uh, as they're driving around. And all of a sudden, Cassandra mentioned to Goldie, hey, I'm going to have a hard time getting my SAG card and getting your acting experience. And Goldie said, hey, I might know somebody who can help and gave her a number. That guy was one of the writers for the Dick Van Dyke show, it turns out. And as luck would have it, he was about to shoot his new show, Lots of Luck with Dom DeLuise. And as a favor to Goldie Hawn, he got Cassandra a one-line spot on the show, and that got her her SAG card. Hey! All she needed to do was go to his house and read some lines with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she didn't say exactly the, what's in the house of it, so who knows? We hope not. Also, one stupid thing, uh, the gig that you get that gets you your SAG card, the uh, SAG union takes half that paycheck, no matter how big it is. Like, you make $10, they take 5 bucks. You make a $1 million, they take 500000 Apparently you know, they the take first, l- your first gig, the one that gets you it? Yeah, apparently, from what I've heard, they literally take half that paycheck, no matter how big it is. Well, you know, as long as that, that as long as not going forward. If it's just your first job to sign you up, fine. Yeah, I think after that, there is still union dues and all this and that. But you know, oh no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not naive to think enough to think there's no union dues. I'm just talking about half that part. So when uh, Cassandra got back from Colorado, she caught her boyfriend cheating on her. So she broke up with him, but they kind of wound up being friends. And at one point, he invites her to uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor's house for a party, where uh, uh, Cassandra finds herself talking to a nice young actor who introduced himself as Bobby. And while those two are chatting, her uh, ex, Matt, who brought her to the party, got really jealous and did that thing where he's like, we're leaving now, grabs her and starts pulling her to the car. Well, as they got to the car, Matt was getting a little rough with her, and little Bobby, the actor, came to Cassandra's aid and chased Matt away. And they decided to go on a date because of this. On this date, Bobby was talking about the movie he had just done, banging the drum slowly and the fact he just got a gig for Godfather 2. Turns out the Bobby Schmidt was actually Robert De Niro, and uh, he had just gotten was, that, uh, yeah, Godfather 2 going there. Yep. And uh, they had a nice date, and the next day he went to New York, and they never saw each other again, but she was like, hey, that was a cool experience. Yeah, especially like going forward like later on, like, oh, damn, that was Robert fucking De Niro. Yeah, yeah, right. Or Bobby, because what, he was no what did he do before Do- Godfather? Because he was Godfather too. He was um, Don Car- a young Don Colleon. Yes, who he was in Godfather two. What uh, before he that do? he uh, did bang the drunk slowly and uh, one other small movie. Well, oh, yeah, you just about. said that, but I, I, I never, I've never seen that movie ever. Yeah, uh, I all I know, bang the drum slowly is the fact uh, it's been spoofed. That town's been spoofed a lot for porns. Oh yeah, that is <laughs> <laughs> that is like. Just it's like prime real estate. It's like bang the drum slowly, but the drum is a chick, eh? Uh, I'm a genius. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you realize how many hours I, I wasted trying to think of this fucking... Let's see. Bang, okay, did it, bang, did it bang the drum slowly? That came out with Mean Street, Show Thereafter, and then Godfather. Uh, before that, uh, I don't recognize any of these movies. Yeah, probably just tiny little bit parts where he's in the background because she did say he was like definitely an up and crump coming actor because he was talking about bang the drum slowly. He's like, this is my big break. And guess what I'm doing now? Yep, his first movie, uncredited. Um, Second one was he was the nephew. It was a short movie. Third, uncredited. Then another one, a greeting's never heard of. What he played himself. Uh, Yeah, this looks like a little. Yeah, he was just a hair ahead of Cassandra and her uh, acting career kind of stuff, huh? Yeah, I mean, because then right after that, like, then he did Bank Drums League Mean Streets that I've heard before. At least I've heard that before. Then Godfather after that, it took off. Taxi yep. Driver. Um, and know. then the sky's the limit. Yeah. And then later it, on, his greatest role ever, as in Rocky and Bullwinkle. Right? <laughs> uh, that's the one I'm going to always remember him for. He wore a monocle in that. He did, right. And honestly, like, it was a pretty good impression. I mean, the movie was trash, but he did a pretty good impression of the character he's supposed to be. Yeah. I never actually saw the movie, but, yeah. Oh, neither have I. I've just seen oh, clips. okay. Yeah, no, I have not either. I just, I've seen bits and pieces, and I'm good. Okay, one more quick romance story with Cassandra that I found very amusing that I need to squeak in here. At one point, she meets Bill Cable, a strapping six-foot-two bodybuilder slash model slash actor who once played Tarzan in a movie. It was lust at first sight, she said. So much so that when he asked her to move into his treehouse with him, she said yes. Yes, like Tarzan, whom he played, he lived in a treehouse. And not like one of those luxury, like, yuppie treehouses you hear about. Apparently, it was literally like this treehouse that, kind of nice that he built up in a tree, but uh, their source of power was one extension cord, like, dangling through the wall. And their source of water was one garden hose dangling through the wall. And the garden hose, like, went to a neighbor's house, and the extension cord, like, went to a power pole outside the place. Did at least so, own the land it was on, or was he like in his parents' backyard? That's a mighty good question. I think he owned the property, but I'm not positive on that. 
Uh, he also liked to talk about how uh, he tried to become a cop, but he couldn't make it because he got busted for dating a stripper. <laughs> so he became a mercenary instead. She had no idea if these stories about his mercenary days were true, but she did know a couple of things. One, he was really into the Soldier of Fortune magazine. And he also had a small arsenal under their bed, including AK-47s, grenades, and a rocket launcher. And body armor, too. And you say, those are all just in case. Seems like a lot of red flags, but boy, how do you parent that sweet, sweet loving was worth it. Oh, Lord. I mean... <laughs> Well, I tell you this story, Nate, because one day on her way to her car and from the big city, Cassandra noticed a bunch of what she called gangbanger types following her. Her danger meter went off the charts as she hurried to her car, locks the doors behind her, and drives off. To her horror, right on her tail is a car full of these same gangbangers, like, keeping right on her butt. Not good, right? right? Well, she does the one thing that she can think of, and she drives to that tree house, and instead of getting out of the car, smart, she starts, like, circling the area and just blaring on the horn, kind of an SOS pattern. And she was just praying that her uh, man, Bill, would hear her. First pass around the house, honking the horn, nothing. Second pass around, hitting the horn, and still nothing. Panic begins to set in. What will Cassandra do? Third pass around, blaring the horn, and what she sees causes her to slam on the brakes and just staring on the middle of the road. There's her man, Bill, standing on the roof of their treehouse, wearing nothing but a loincloth with a bowie knife in his mouth and an AK-47 in his hands. Wow. This motherfucker grabs a rope, swings down into the middle of the road, and fires off a series of precision shots right over the gangbangers' cars, and they boogie the hell out of there. And apparently, Cassandra is dating Brock Sampson from the Venture Brothers, is all I could think of as I'm reading this. Right? <laughs> yep. But he saved the day there. And um, I'm guessing if you're willing to swing out of a tree with a Bowie knife in your teeth and AK-47 in your hands, you might actually be a mercenary. Who knows? Well, sure. You could also just be fucking crazy. So, anyways, that's a fun story. Especially the fact he was nude with nothing but a loincloth on. That's that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's good intimidation factor right there. Work-wise, she was able to land a part-time job as a production assistant on Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. It was a uh, local TV show, one of those, it was kind of like an American bandstand sort of thing where people would just come in and play, and they'd have also like comedians and this and that. She loved this job because, among other things, the pay, well, not great, was better than she was used to, and also pretty lenient because there's actually a part-time gig she kind of just show up as they would need it but also she was once again getting to schmooze with the rock stars she got to hung out with the likes of ario speedwagon the commodores linda ronstant edgar winter group she got to say rick or she got to see rick james penis at that job i'm guessing a lot of people got to see rick james penis back in the day though i'm just guessing yeah it's, yeah <laughs> yeah it's... he seems like one of those dudes that as soon as he did a line of cocaine he was just like look what i got yeah i, mean, I, I would make i would assume if being around him at that time, it was not like it wasn't hard. Yeah, it was one of those things like, oh my god, I can't believe I saw that. I was like, oh, I only saw his penis twice today. By the way, I did not mean that. I did not uh, intend that pun. There was a pun there. It wasn't hard. Oh, yeah. We'll be back after these messages. <laughs> uh, also, that show was the first place that Arsenio Hall made his uh, TV debut. And Cassandra was there for that. And um, oh, nice. She's been yeah. pretty lucky. I mean, it, if it wasn't for uh, who she becomes, I, I would be like, I don't know. This chick sounds like she's just full of shit. Cause yeah, she's yeah. always just happening right. Just so happens to be where she needs to be to witness this thing happening. But I mean, it's a virus. I mean, it's yeah. not. And uh, now you know why I called her kind of a Forrest Gump. Not because she's mentally challenged. She was just kind of there for everything. She also did uh, Arsino's makeup for his first appearance on TV, too, because she was uh, one of her uh, jobs there was to do makeup for the stars if they asked for it. One downside of this, though, she was supposed to provide her own makeup. And since she was poor, she only had uh, one base shade for her makeup kit, and it was the wrong color for Arsino's skin tone. Apparently, he wound up looking really ashy and looked like crap for his appearance, and he still gives her playful ribbing over this if they still meet up. He's like, hey, remember that time you made me look awful for my TV debut? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. Yeah. It's all fun, though. It worked out, so everybody's happy. He seems cool. I mean, I've, I've never heard anything necessarily negative about Arsenio Hall. Yeah, uh, neither have I, actually. I mean, it's a bummer that he, you know, had the, the late night thing, because he was, of the of the late night wars, if you will, uh, he was always my favorite. He was the first to go. Well, working on this show, one of her old Vegas connections gave her a call. It's all her old Vegas connections that keep calling her up. The old producers and, you know, dance instructors from the show and stuff. They're like, hey, we liked working with her, I suppose. We'll hire her again. Well, anyways, this guy was going to do a comedy show in Reno called The Boob Tube Review. 
And she was excited about this because she always wanted to work in comedy. During this show's run, it was kind of just like an almost not really an improv, but a bunch of comedians just doing a little skit comedy on stage. During this run, she would actually get to work with none other than Al Franken of SNL and politics fame. They uh, did a skit that I- sounds kind of dumb, but, you know, whatever. But, yeah, Al Franken, she was hold- she was like uh, borderline naked holding like a uh, weather map. And Al Franken was like doing the weather report on there and like getting increasingly horny and like drawing like wet spots and stuff. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Yeah, it, she was like, it was kind of a dumb routine, but whatever. <laughs> I really like Al Franken. I, I hate that, you know, I also liked him as a senator, but then again, that's because, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, it sucks what happened to him. But that, but to like, what brought him down as a senator, that is tracks from what that skit was. Yeah. yeah. Also kind of a sad story. When I was actually campaigning to run for Senate, uh, Cassandra attended a fundraiser and was like, hey, remember me when we worked on stage and... Apparently, he actually pretended that he didn't know her, or as far as she could tell, pretended and kind of hurt her feelings. Oh, that that does suck. Never mind. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I still like Al Franken, but that's that's pretty shitty. The show, while successful, came to an end fairly quickly due to the show's producers getting into spats with casino owners. We are currently in 1974. Cassandra is 23 years old, just as an FYI, and she's room, she's moving from Reno back to L.A. once again. Around this time, Will Chamberlain, old Uncle Wilty, had just recently built a massive mansion in Bel Air at the top of Mulholland Drive, and this place instantly became the party house to be at. Cassandra was invited a couple of times there, and said it was one of the most impressive houses she's ever seen. Uh, and actually, it was one of those things, like, you could lay on his bed and push a button, and, like, the world's biggest TV you'd ever see would just, like, emerge from the floor. One of those kind That's of things. Cool. Like, yeah, and, like, push a button, like, the whole roof just comes out of certain uh, areas. She said it was like one of the most advanced houses you would ever see back in the day. Well, let's be real, though. I mean, the biggest TV I've ever seen for back then probably is like half the screen that I have now. One time when she was invited to this house, Uncle Wilty would take her uh, to show her all his giant walk-in closet that had like all the jerseys from all the teams he uh, played for. And apparently this closet was literally like the size of most people's houses. It was in this closet where uh, Uncle Wilty would unfortunately rape Cassandra. Yeah, I was waiting for that. Yeah. Based Cassandra on what would you actually, said last time, because I was like, I, I, of course, I was thinking he's gonna have sex with her, but like, kind of you, you, the implication you gave me last time we this this came up before we like ended last time, I I was afraid it was going there. Yeah, Cassandra would actually keep this a secret until this book was released in 2021, I believe. 2020. Is he still alive? Well, actually, this is where off to off topic tried to get Wilt's response to this and learned that he has been dead for about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we reached out to Wilt. <laughs> yep, I got a word back from his state saying, yeah, he's been dead for a while. Leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> we then got a Ouija board. <laughs> yeah, right. His answer his answer was non-responsive. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but she, this was a secret she'd carry with her because of guilt. And uh, and of course, as you know, you know, she was a uh, out of work Vegas, ex-Vegas showgirl back in the 70s. She accused Will Chamberlain of rape. Probably would have gotten her in more trouble. Oh no! Than him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have ruined was, her life, not his. I, I mean, as as shitty as that is, and you know, I totally sympathize and I believe her. I mean, but it, that, yeah, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. Like from back in the day, for what she was trying to do, especially they would have painted her back. Especially she's a showgirl. Yeah, I mean, ex showgirl who's like down yeah. to luck. And Will Chamberlain is one of the biggest, most beloved sports there, stars in the world at that time. No way. It, you're absolutely right. It, yeah, the yeah. only outcome would have been her career being ruined. So also too, when you hear all those stories about Will Chamberlain having sex with twenty thousand women over the course of his life, remember, not all were consensual. So on that note, yeah. fuck you, Wilt. Right. Yep. I mean, there's a reason why there's like Genghis Khan is a uh, you, know, you find Genghis Khan DNA. So many people out there, it wasn't he wasn't exactly out there wooing women. Yeah, all huh, right. <laughs> so you can say the same thing on Will Chamberlain. Yeah, he had twenty thousand women, but I, I dilate that he was out there wooing them all. Uh, <laughs> Genghis Khan. That's the reason his empire crumbled was because he's going on too many romantic dates. <laughs> he's like <laughs> keeps on reenacting like the uh, was it the Robo scene from The Little Mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> he has a soldier singing "Kiss the Girl" in the background, and like as soon as he's <laughs> done, he's like, "Let's do this again, quick, 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 set it back up, get this bitch out of here." <laughs> he has like his troops just training crabs to perform, and they're like, "You have no idea how hard this is." He's like, "Just keep doing it." <laughs> uh. So, after returning to L.A. this most recent time, Cassandra began, ta- began taking acting lessons so she could be the best actress she could be if she gets a job. In her class with her was future Wonder Woman actor Linda Carter and future urban cowboy and terms of endearment actor Deborah Winger. When I hear Deborah Winger, yes. I always just think of that band Winger. When I think Deborah Winger, I think who? 
I mean, as people have noticed on the show, I'm good with faces. I'm terrible with names. So, I mean, the fact that I didn't know who Deborah Winger was at the top of my head. Okay, I recognize her. <laughs> uh, yeah, the fact that I didn't recognize her name. Like, oh, no, really? You didn't recognize someone's name? <laughs> but you didn't recognize Linda Carter. Well, yeah, because it's Wonder Woman. I mean, <laughs> she, I don't know. She was a little bit more, you know, being a geek. I, I, I liked that pretty fast. A little bit later in 1974, the producer of the Boob Tube Review gives Cassandra a call and says he's putting together another act. This one called Mama's Boys. This act would be Cassandra, six gay men, and a token straight man doing song, comedy, dance, and drag routines. Kind of like a vaudeville burlesque show. They started with a stint in San Francisco, and they got popular in a hurry. After San Francisco, they did a stint in San Diego, and then things kind of blew up, and they went on the road, up and down the coasts, doing gay, gay discos and clubs left and right. Times were pretty good during this, other than the occasional time they would get stiffed on their pay. Because apparently, you know, a, a lot of clubs, clubs are kind of run by either the mafia or really seedy people, even the gay ones. Yeah. So, yeah, sometimes you show them like, hey, can we get our pay? And they just pull a gun on you and be like, no. In back in the day, them being gay, they were just. Exactly. Kind of the same thing with the Will Chamberlain, where it's like they can complain, but. Mm. Yeah, it, they'll be immediately dismissed. Eventually, the show settled down in what at the time was considered the gay mecca of the Northeast. Provincetown, Massachusetts, of all places. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Well, on this stint, Cassandra got a boyfriend in that neck of the woods and stayed at his place most of the time. On the street level of that building he lived in was a clothing store run by Cookie Mueller, who was one of John Waters' OG crew, the Dreamlanders. Remember John Waters from our John Waters episode? Yeah, John Waters. Yeah, k k, -k crossover One day, Cassandra was looking out the window of their place, and on the beach below, she saw a huge, pale, white blob on the beach just laying there. Can you guess who this was? Uh, I thought a jellyfish. <laughs> it was legendary drag queen Divine tanning himself. Uh, that's so funny. I was just in my head, like, laughing about the idea. Like, because you said that. I was like, oh, you probably saw Divine out there eating dog shit. Yeah. <laughs> it was Divine. It was <laughs> like, Divine. Dog shit. Just laying there like a big beast whale, she said. <laughs> she was like, it's a very unattractive sight to watch him sunbathe. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. This really excited Cassandra, though, knowing the legendary drag queen was in the neighborhood. Because... Uh, she tried to make friends with him, but her attempts were usually blown off by a divine, just uninteresting grunting and snarling at her. Just be like, eh, uh-huh, sure, whatever, lady. Oh, that sucks. This bummed out Cassandra because all gay men love her. All drag queens love her. Why doesn't divine love her? Uh, well, actually, I have an answer for that, to be honest. From my John Waters research, we didn't actually talk about this, but according to John Waters and a lot of John Waters' group, divine wasn't gay. Yes, divine did have sex with men on occasion. But uh, only really on occasion as a treat. Pretty much it was like, yeah, he was like 90%. Treat. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, basically you'd, you'd see him like making out with dudes on camera, but that's only because it was in the script. And he was like, well, if it's in the script, I'm going to do it. Like the dog. I mean, anything. you know what? I believe it. Like, it was yeah. in script. He ate dog shit. Dude ate dog shit. If it's a I mean. yep. And yeah, he did have sex with dudes in public, but it's usually, you know, just, or not in public, but you know, behind the scenes or at clubs. But uh, for the most part, Divine considered himself straight, and pretty much everybody knew him was like, nah, he's a straight dude. Yeah, he has sex with guys once in a blue moon, but mm, he mainly has sex with women. So there you go. The reason Div uh, Divine, the gay man, didn't love her is because he wasn't gay, I guess. So she can still say that all gay men love her. Yeah, yeah but it's like, but still, it's like, as a, you think of a straight man, they're like, what? what's going on? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, why is she being so nice to me or trying to be nice to me? Yeah, I know. Like, even then, it's like, I still, I, I guess the logic still doesn't track. It's like, okay, sure, he's not gay, but he's that he's a straight man rejecting like a gorgeous woman. What's yeah, gonna... yeah. It should, maybe she was being a little try hard or something at the time. I guess. Yeah. Also, Divine seemed kind of like a cranky fellow at times, to be yeah, honest. I, yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Also, uh, according to John Waters, too, he was actually, uh, Divine was planning on giving up the uh, drag queen act later in his life because he was just kind of done with uh, you know carrying around giant fake breasts and stuff and that's gonna do it for this episode tune in next time because we're finally getting to that historic moment where Cassandra becomes Elvira and all the good and bad that comes with it this is where the ending jingle goes this is where the ending jingle goes. I don't know if we need one. I don't know if we'll get one. But if we do, then here is where it goes.